Iron Teeth. Then, the 23rd of September, 1954, hundreds of children pour out of the districts of Glasgow and into the necropolis, out of the Gorbals and Govan Hill, Strathbungo and Lauriston, Torrey Glen, Mount Florida, Oaklands and Paul Maddy, over the bridge from Brigton and the Barras and Braidfold, through the Grand Gatehouse on Caledonia Road, its single turret standing watch over the south side of the city, over the walls and through gaps in old stone, all but burying up from underneath the ground itself. They stalk the sepulchre, feral and wild, wielding weapons, sharpened sticks and stakes, penknives and potato guns, under the cover of a dark blue night and the watch of the White Lady, who locals say turns her head as you walk by. Eyes wide and wild, they're somewhere between real and demon, between boy and girl, sweating and snarling, ripped shirts and torn skirts searching for something unspoken, something with iron teeth. In the weeks that follow, the children will deny their involvement in the search for the Gorbals vampire. Some will scoff at the idea that anyone had ever believed there had been a monster in the southern necropolis at all. When questioned by the police, they will laugh or lie, claim alibis in grannies and aunties and big cousins who live in other parts of the city altogether. And they all, but they all remember the turn of a cloak, a blood red dress, a flash of iron. This is a true story. Now, Aaron ate their lunch in the necropolis every day because they liked the aesthetic. They had garnered a cult following from taking photos of the gravestones, Victorian and Edwardian, some cracked and fallen over, others so worn that the names and dates no longer showed, and posting them on Instagram with shitty filters alongside quotes from Michael Kors from Project Runway. A close-up of an ornate carved ornate rose carved into heavy stone alongside taste is something that you just can't learn. An ancient arm holding a scroll, the text on it long since faded away, written underneath, busy and tacky. A faceless woman in graying white stone overgrown with ivy. She looks like a Victorian cocktail waitress in Las Vegas. Aaron didn't know why this was so funny to them, but other people seemed to like it. Other than the gravestones, they had only ever posted a handful of blurry selfies. They hadn't really felt comfortable looking the world in the eye for a while. Nothing centered Aaron as much as the necropolis did. The sense that you were out of time, somewhere in between. They liked the fact that you were in the middle of this place, more or less unchanged since the 1800s, but you could look up and see that you were surrounded by 60s and 70s tower blocks. You could hear the cars and vans go past on the main road. It was the middle of another tough shift in the cafe around the corner. Part of the South Side's gentle gentrification meant a steady stream of customers who clashed. Busy mums and student hipsters and queers of every denomination, all with the same penchant for halfway decent coffee and selected vegan cakes. Old dears out for tea and an empire biscuit with their grandchildren, who pivoted from young man to hen in referring to Aaron and got frustrated when they couldn't find one that stuck. Aaron wasn't sure if they didn't mind or if they didn't care. Aaron's boss, a fussy middle-aged woman who had moved from the West End when her husband quit his job and resented the fact that she had to work in a cafe, had been a cow to Aaron all shift. She'd been shitty with Aaron when they had knocked over a glass of water and when they had given the goth girl who came in every day to read for an hour before college a large coffee instead of a medium. Aaron had pretended it was an accident, but it was definitely on purpose. Sometimes serving that goth girl was the only thing that kept Aaron going. Aaron almost wished their boss would yell at them so that they could leave dramatically, but they knew she was too worried about being called homophobic or transphobic to be anything other than low-level passive-aggressive all day. Aaron knew that if she did say anything, they definitely wouldn't handle it well. They had previous. It was pretty wearing. 
Usually the necropolis was all but empty, except for the occasional daytime dog walker, a cast of regulars that had become familiar in Aaron's six months of living in the south side. The lesbian couple with a whippet who walked hand in hand when they thought no one was looking. A white girl who always dressed in pink pajama bottoms and a coat with a furry collar, who smoked a cigarette and talked on the phone while smoking her old fat pug. An old Indian man who held his hands behind his back and whistled as his well-behaved lurcher ran on ahead, occasionally looking back to check that the man was okay. Aaron and the old man always gave each other a friendly nod. It was the closest Aaron came to socialising outside of work. Aaron hadn't seen the old man in a while, and they worried, what, they worried about what had happened to him. During the summer, the occasional confused tourist would walk through, presumably having mistaken the southern necropolis for its more bombastic counterpart in the city centre. But today, the necropolis was empty. Until it wasn't. Aaron was sat on a little broken wall, cold damp, zone, cold, damp stone sending a chill up their back. They were listening to a podcast when some commotion from the main road, a car backfiring, the screeching of tyres, a horn, made them look up, popping a headphone out of one ear. A shiver. A figure stood in the middle of the gatehouse. When the figure realised Aaron was watching, it began making its way towards them. The figure wore a long cloak that billowed in the light breeze. Their hair, black and grey, in a clumsy Betty Page cut, blew back from their face, forehead too high, skin pale and thin as paper. Dramatic. As the figure drew closer, the black cloak unfurled in the wind, revealing what looked like an old-fashioned red dress underneath, dusty and muddy at the hem. Probably a cosplayer, Aaron thought. An eccentric take on Dracula, maybe, or one of those gothic Lolita girls you see in town. Except they hovered, lightly, around six inches off the ground, black boots with pointed toes pointing down. Aaron wondered whether or not they were having some sort of episode. They weren't sure whose episode it was. The figure hovered in front of them now, about two arms lengths away. Shouldn't you be running and screaming? A voice like a drill through teeth, piercing and whining and sharp. They were somewhere between real and demon, boy and girl. A glimpse of something from inside the mouth, a dull silver. Probably, Aaron replied, but I'm a millennial. We're famously glib. A sharp smile, pointed teeth like a shark's, each one made of metal and flecked with rust. Who are you? asked Aaron. Jenny, said Jenny, or the vampire with the iron teeth, but that sounds a bit pretentious. I was trying to make iron teeth a thing for a while, but no one really went with it. I like it, said Aaron. Iron teeth, thanks, replied iron teeth. After a moment's awkward silence, Aaron worried that they might be talking to themselves. It had happened before. Okay, said Aaron. What are you? Imaginary friend, fairy god sibling, my brain's way of coping with a repressed memory or a psychological reaction to everything that has happened six months ago that I still haven't really processed. Whichever you fancy, I suppose, said Iron Teeth. I hadn't really thought about it. What makes you think I'm imaginary? Well, said Aaron, the flying, floating, hovering. Oh, said Iron Teeth as if they'd only just considered it, and they dropped to the ground with such force that Aaron worried that their skinny bones might splinter and snap. They didn't. What's this? asked Iron Teeth, as they threaded their thin fingers through wire on Aaron's headphones. The headphones, they said. Listen? Aaron often offered Iron Teeth an earbud. They listened together for a moment, a new true crime podcast about a murder that had been just solved somewhere in America. Aaron found true crime fast comforting, though they could only listen to the ones where the detectives caught the bad guys. Aaron wondered what this must look like, whether Iron Teeth was real or not. Weird, said Iron Teeth, passing the earbud back to Aaron. Shouldn't you come out at night? Aaron asked. It would be more atmospheric with the cloak and all. 
You'd think, said I in teeth, but this place shuts at six o'clock and you, do, you don't strike me as the sort of person who breaks into a graveyard at night. Aaron didn't really do anything at night, just went back to their studio flat and ate frisps in the dark. They suspected they'd had it, have it in them to be an alcoholic, but they didn't like the taste of booze. So you're here for me specifically, asked Aaron. Iron Teeth ignored them. What happened six months ago? Aaron had hoped they wouldn't ask. I don't really talk about it, they said. Aaron felt a heat rise to their face as, at the thought of it. Their breath stalled in their chest as they quickly batted the thought away. They'd had four free counselling sessions with occupational therapy. It hadn't been enough. You can talk about it to me, said Iron Teeth. I won't tell anybody. I might not even be here. I might not even be real. Are you? Most people can't see me if you want to get spooky about it, said Iron Teeth. Spooky, said Aaron. It's nothing, really. Standard, run-of-the-mill nervous breakdown, to be honest. Depression, generalised anxiety, panic attacks. I was doing a PhD, trying to. Historicity and geography, queer space and time. I was hoping to get a job as a gay time lord. Aaron laughed at their own weak joke, a line they'd used the few times they'd talked about their PhD with people they'd met on Tinder. They'd never had a second date. Iron Teeth didn't say anything. Aaron noticed that their breath was raspy and old. They wheezed if they did, as if they didn't have long for this world. Anyway, I was running a seminar. I had a panic attack. They told me to take some time off, Aaron continued. I did, and spent more or less two months in my flat, eating takeaway and watching box sets, burning through my scholarship, then my savings. I couldn't even read. Then I quit my PhD, sold all my books and records, and moved to a part of town where I don't know anybody so that at least I'd have an excuse not to go out. And I guess I've been here since. I work in the cafe around the corner, come here every lunchtime. I'm not really sure what happens next. What's your story, anyway? Bit more interesting than that, said Iron Teeth, but you have to earn it. Oh, said Aaron, leaning in. For the first time in a while, they were interested, at least. Sertraline had taken the edge off everything. It was nice. How's that? What do you want to happen next? asked Iron Teeth, ignoring Aaron's question again. They took a seat next to Aaron and still sat several heads taller. Aaron could swear they, swear they heard the crack and rattle as Iron Teeth's bones unsettled as they moved. You think, I think we're a lot alike. You could be like me one day. Aaron took the lock of hair behind their ear, turned to face Iron Teeth. There's this girl, said Aaron. Are you going to ask her out? Probably not, they said. But I am going to ask her if she wants to hang out. That's a start, right? It's definitely something, said Iron Teeth. You know, I was like you once, stuck on one path and too scared to move on to another. And then this, whatever this is. How could I be like you, asked Aaron, who wasn't listening. I'd have to bite you. That seems like it would hurt, said Aaron, considering Iron Teeth's iron fucking teeth and all, and not very hygienic. Not if I'm a figment of your imagination, said Iron Teeth. Remember when I said I had a nervous breakdown, said Aaron. I imagined most of that and it still hurt. Would I be able to fly? I think so, said Iron Teeth. Eventually. It takes a while to learn to fly, though. Why don't you look people in the eye when you're speaking to them? I just feel like they're judging me, said Aaron. All the time, actually. But especially when I look them in the eye. You care what people think. Doesn't everybody, asked Aaron, meeting Iron Teeth's eye for the first time. The wind blew their Betty Page hair off their high forehead again. There was something about Iron Teeth's eyes, black and bloodshot, yellowing like an old person's and sad. It freaked Aaron out more than the hovering. Not me, said Iron Teeth, waving a hand over the cloak and boots, their tattered red dress. I suppose not, said Aaron. Anyway, I don't know if I want to be like you, but thanks. Iron Teeth shrugged and then they laughed, a sad little laugh. Aaron got another glimpse of those teeth, sharp and rusty. They really did look like they'd hurt. Somewhere out on Caledonia Road, a car stalled. Startled, Aaron turned to look, felt the monster beside them turn to look too. When they turned back, the monster was gone. 
the white lady who locals said turned her head as you watched as turned her head to watch as you walked by now gray and faceless was staring at them as if as they sat alone in the necropolis again aaron put their lunchbox away they were going to ask the goth girl out <laughs> <laughs>